Hi, my name is Kristen Lafferty from Ohio Health, and this is part of the Family Medicine Radiology Educational Series. Today, I'll be talking about x-rays of the shoulder and some shoulder pathology, and I have no um, disclosures regarding this topic. Objectives for today will include learning a systematic approach to reading the musculoskeletal x-rays of the shoulder joint, um, to review three common adult findings on x-ray, and then to discuss some clinical condition correlation of these x-ray findings. So starting with the systematic approach, um, when obtaining or looking at x-rays of the shoulder, I always start with looking at the soft tissues and then moving on to my bone cortices. Um, so looking at your clavicle, your scapula, your chromion, um, humerus, and all the relationships between those, and then specifically moving on to the joints. And in the shoulder, there are two main joints, that's your glenohumeral joint and your acromioclavicular joint. And then um, there are some surrounding structures that you don't want to ignore when you're obtaining radiographs of the shoulder. And generally, those include things like your individual ribs, um, the lung, and uh, left heart border if it's the left shoulder, or right heart um, you know, border if it's the right. And sometimes it's not radiographically evident, but if it's there, you don't want to not take a peek at it. So these are the views of the shoulder that we'll go over today. Um, for the most part, so you have your AP or anterior posterior radiograph, your gracie, which is an internal oblique view, and then your scapular Y, um, and we'll go over what they're useful for. Yep. So first, starting with your AP radiograph of the shoulder, this helps look at a lot of the bony anatomy of the shoulder itself. So first with the clavicle coming across, your scapula all the way through the back your acromioclavicular joint. So this is your acromion here and your clavicle, and obviously the joint between the two bones. Then you have your glenohumeral joint, so your humerus, and then your glenoid over here. Um, often can see your greater and lesser tuberosities off of the humerus. And then also your entire proximal humerus is within this radiograph. And like I said before, don't ignore your other surrounding structures such as soft tissues, um, individual ribs the lung, and then what's available to see of the heart. You can also see vertebrae too, so um, don't forget those either. Moving on to your gray she film. This is the best film to really look at that glenoral humeral joint really well, and your greater tuberosity since it's a bit of an internally rotated humeral view. Um, but you can see the whole area of your glenoid and humerus and really take a peek at that joint. Axillary and scapular Y view. So down here on the left is an axillary view of the shoulder. And over here on the right is a scapular Y view. And these are most useful when suspecting a dislocation. So it really looks at the relationship between the glenoid and your humerus and make sure that there's uh, congruence or that they're you know meeting one another. And if they're not, that's when you suspect a dislocation. So the three common adult conditions we'll talk about are arthritis, impingement or rotator cuff disease, and acute trauma such as dislocation. Um, and the arthritis we'll talk about obviously includes both joints in the shoulder, um, acromioclavicular and glenohumeral. And then with impingement, we'll also talk about some sequela of impingement that are usually more radiographically evident like calcific tendonitis. And then with acute trauma, mostly dislocation, but subluxations could lead to some similar clinical findings. So starting with arthritis of the glenohumeral joint, as we discussed before, the Gracie view is the best radiographic view of the shoulder to look at that glenohumeral joint. And here we can see almost all the criteria being met for arthritis. So bone cysts or these little, let's say black areas within the bone itself, osteophytes or bony projections coming off the superior and inferior portions of the glenoid. You can see subchondral sclerosis or almost a pacification of the bone beneath the normal surface of the cortex. So it just looks like red or white here and then loss of joint space as well. So almost all those criteria are met. And this radiograph likely has some acromioclavicular arthritis as well, but really meant to show you the glenoral humeral arthritis since it's pretty significant. Looking at a AP view of the acromioclavicular joint, again, just describing or showing some more arthritis. So we see loss of joint space between the clavicle and the acromion and also pretty significant osteophyte formation of both that distal end of the clavicle and your acromion. So moving on to subacromial impingement, important to note that this is 
usually more of a clinical diagnosis and radiographs are generally normal in folks that have impingement. Um, basically what happens is the rotator cuff kind of pinches up underneath the sacromion, causing pain, sometimes bursitis and rotator cuff changes. Um, it is a little more common in folks that have some changes, normal anatomical changes to the acromion. So on this scapular Y view, you can see your acromion really darn well. Um, a type one acromion is a normal flat kind of acromion. A type two has a little bit of a curve to it, likely in this radiograph. And a type three almost has a complete hook shape. So it really decreases the clearance of your humerus. Um, so for the most part, folks with subacromial impingement or rotator cuff tendonitis tend to have normal x-rays. Um, but important to note on this next slide here that folks that have some sequela of long-term um, rotator cuff tendinopathy and possibly impingement can um, display signs of calcific tendinitis. And that's when the um, disease tendon itself fills in with some calcium deposition. And on this film here, uh, either Grisha or AP, you can usually see this really well. You can see an area of um, like calcific density, usually within the region of the supraspinatus. And that is indicative of calcific tendonitis, which is easily seen on radiographs. Moving on to dislocations. Um, so here's an AP view, which is not always the easiest for dislocations, but this one's obvious as an anterior dislocation. We can tell that the humerus is no longer within the glenoid. And this is a good view to look for any possible fractures that might be a sequela of a dislocation episode. So making sure you take a good peek at the back end of the humerus as you can have something called a hill sex lesion there. And also looking at the glenoid itself since there are fractures associated with that called bony bank heart lesions. On this gray sheet film here, we're showing an example of that bony bank heart lesion, which is this fracture fragment or ossific density just inferior to the glenoid rim. When the humerus either dislocates anteriorly or posteriorly, it can actually knock off a piece of that glenoid leaving a fracture fragment. Um, also to note, you can have inferior dislocations that do the same thing, but um, different views will show some of those glenoid issues better. So a gray sheet film would be great to look for a possible bony bank heart lesion. And then the most common x-ray that we really want to take a peek at is your scapular Y or an axillary view when you're suspecting a dislocation because it shows that relationship of the humerus and the glenoid really well. So here, obviously, the humerus is not congruent with the glenoid. So therefore, we are looking at a um, humerus dislocation. Important to note, too, that you can't always see fracture findings on x-rays, but if you suspect one, since there is maybe some locking or catching of the joint after a dislocation, a CT scan can be really helpful in confirming those fractures. Um, and in some dislocations, there's certainly sequela. Um, it's not just one incident that doesn't necessarily have some side effects to it. Folks can tear their labrum, which is a bit of a suction cup for the glenoid in the humerus. Um, and if we're suspecting a labral tear it's because somebody has significant instability or really bad pain uh, ongoing after a dislocation, an MRI, specifically an MRI orthogram would be really helpful in diagnosing that. Important to know that uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound um, is helpful with point of care testing. You can look at the glenoid. Um, sometimes you can see the labrum well in smaller folks. And you can also check out your rotator cuff tendons pretty darn well. And then the most important thing to remember is that x-rays are really important both prior and prior to reduction and after reduction of a dislocation to make sure that you achieved the results, but also to see and look for any fracture fragments that you might find within the joint. Um, and, and you know, if it's within the joint, that could be an issue. Uh, so definitely wanna take a good look at those x-rays pre and post. So in summary, Gracie view is the most helpful in evaluating for pathology of that glenoral humeral joint. AP and scapular Y, helpful in evaluating acute trauma episodes like dislocations. Remember that most overuse injuries like rotator cuff tendinitis or tendinopathy and impingement may have normal radiographs, um, but still worthwhile to look at your radiographs because it helps with that diagnosis. And then um, sometimes sequela of these overuse injuries like calcific tendinitis are readily or easily seen on plain radiographs. And then radiographs can help us form treatment plans. So anyone with chronic pain or newer and acute pain may benefit from x-rays. And then 
Do not forget to use a systematic approach to reading x-rays of the shoulder or any joint for that matter, um, just so you don't miss anything else that could potentiate uh, patient symptoms. Okay, thank you for listening.